So I recently found my way down to North Devon to go for a day's riding with Nathan of Dorothy's Speed Shop. We went on one of his uh, A2 class adventure days, so it's a bunch of different adventure bikes and some not so adventure bikes that are all A2 compliant. And on these days he allows you to ride them uh, through a variety of different terrain to get to know each bike and frequently switch between them. I collected a load of footage, I didn't narrate it at the time, but I thought it might be fun to put it together into a video and talk about which bikes I liked and which I didn't. I've deliberately not looked up specs, I've not looked up um, other people's reviews because I don't want to be tainted by what other people think of these bikes. For 99% of the time, this was my first experience of the bike. I did take out a Himalayan 452 briefly on the road a while back, but that was part of an ordained test ride, um, and I didn't get to spend as much time with it as I'd like, or throw it at the scenery. If this kind of thing sounds at all interesting to you, please do pop down to the comments. Um, I'm showing the website on screen. Go over to Dorothy's Speed Shop website, get in touch with Nathan, and get yourself booked in on one of these days. They're great fun, um, and at the very least you'll get to try out a whole bunch of bikes that you might never have ridden before. So without further ado, let's get into it, and first we're going to talk about the bike that I got on with the least. So we're going to do this in reverse order, bikes that I didn't like first, all the way through to bikes that I did, and unfortunately the Honda CRF 300 is on the bottom of my list, purely because I'm quite a heavy bloke, and the suspension on this thing is woefully undersprung for someone of my weight. Um, you can see we're riding off-road with it here, and every pothole and bump I had this thing bottoming out either front or back um, and in some cases in a fairly uncontrollable way that or bouncing between front and back I found myself hanging really far back um, as I'm standing on this bike just to try and stop the forks bottoming and the bottom of holes it's not really a fault of the bike a lot of people love these things some people have gone around the world twice on them but for me it completely killed the bike um, I couldn't ride it as quickly as I wanted to, so I found myself slowing right down to try and deal with the soft suspension. The other thing is, I have a 27 inch inseam, I'm a short guy, um, and even with this thing stopped and the suspension heavily compressed, touching the ground was not impossible but a bit of a challenge, and that meant that mounting it and dismounting it or having to manually hustle it around off-road would have been really difficult for me. And Personally, that's not something I want in a bike. If I'm going adventuring, if I'm going off down muddy, boggy lanes, I really want to know that the bike is there to help me out and that I'm not going to be hindered by my short legs versus a tall bike. Don't have much else really to say about this bike. I was so consumed with trying to keep it under control with my um, <laughs> ample weight that I didn't get a chance to think about things like dynamics or the engine. The engine was perfectly fine, maybe a little asthmatic compared to some of the other bikes that were there. Um, I think really a colleague of mine said it really well. This bike felt outclassed on the day. That doesn't make it a bad bike. There were just better things to ride. So onto the BMW 310GS, second from bottom in my list. Um, and this is just because it's not what I fancy. So as an adventure bike, uh, it's sort of well known for being adequate and there's a rally raid kit that makes it better which this one had i think my problem with it is that for lack of a better word it feels like a 125 that sniffs some white powder it's really hectic it's really revvy and to get the best out of it you've absolutely got to thrash the snot out of it if that's what you like and you want a small adventure bike this thing's absolutely brilliant but for me i've gotten quite used to the kind of himalayan pace of life using the torque of the engine um, and not riding like I'm on a racetrack when I'm on more of an adventure ride. And that's how this bike feels. I've got some footage cut in here of it on uh, the top of the moors, going absolutely hell for leather as best I can within the speed limit, and swinging this thing around between corners, banging it off the red line, um, furiously shifting gear to gear. Felt fantastic in that kind of terrain, but I wouldn't want to be trying to find all of that power low down stuck in a muddy bog. Just personal preference, really. Um, a lot of other people there on the day absolutely love this bike. In fact, one guy was so smitten by it that he's decided he's going to go and buy one. Just not for me, really. Um, in that moment, in this footage, it was fantastic, but just not how I like my adventure bikes. Um, it was negatives, I suppose, where it was very vibey, um, but then what do you expect from a, a small single with a red liner 10k? 
and that had had a bit of a negative effect on the build of the bike. This particular one, where it, I guess, gets taken out like this and thrashed a lot, was a bit rattly and a bit buzzy. The windscreen buzzed, a few things on the handlebars buzzed. But you could tighten them up. It's not that big a problem. It still felt solid as a bike. One other thing to note about this is the cockpit position. Um, I'm not sure if this was just a little strange for me. Uh, good things, it was very easy to get on, it was very low to the ground, but it pushes you into the tank a little bit. It kind of reminds me of my VFR 800 VTEC. And so it's a bit of an odd sensation to be up high off the ground on a bike like this in a position like that. But after about 30 seconds, it felt quite natural. Um, so yeah, if that's your jam, BMW 310GS, fill your boots, they're really cheap second hand as well, so... So onto the Triumph Scrambler 400X, um, another bike that I think is just not my cup of tea really. So this feels a lot like my other half's Interceptor. It feels like a road bike because it is a road bike. Um, it has that kind of geometry feel, it turns that way. This is the first bike where I felt like I could pass comment on the engine um, and because it reminded me mostly of the Himalayan 452, it has a very interesting throttle map whereby first gear feels like you'd expect a bike of its engine size to feel, second gear feels very much the same, and then in third and fourth all of a sudden there's a big packet of torque that feels like it wasn't there to start with. Um, and it makes it quite engaging to ride, it's good fun to rip around on and rev out, but if I'm looking for an adventure bike I'm looking for an adventure bike, not kind of a street scrambler. Uh, just personal preference again but I think this bike is probably a good stepping stone for those who have previously liked to take things like an Interceptor and stick knobbly tyres on them and, um, you know, headlight meshes and things like that. It's a little bit closer from the factory to that kind of bike, and a few of my colleagues absolutely loved this thing and said it was the most fun bike of the day. For me, maybe I've been jaded by my previous Triumph ownership experience. I had a Tiger 800, which was a brilliant bike, but it let me down more times than I care to remember. Um, and arguably, that's the kind of bike you want if you're doing proper off-roading, so I'd probably judge this one a little harshly. Go and have a ride. You'll either like it or you won't. Um, if you know your Triumphs and you've ridden one before, it very much feels like a Triumph. If you haven't, go try it out. Nothing more to say than that. So the Vosges 300 Rally, this one surprised me. This bike to me felt very similar to the 411 Himalayan. It's not the most refined thing in the world. It's not the most um, well thought out or well put together thing in the world. But it feels dependable and it feels basic and it feels like it goes where you point it. Um, I had no complaints about this bike other than maybe it was a little bit tall for my tiny legs, but only slightly. Uh, but for the price that I know these are, this is a fantastic adventure bike to pick up, throw down some lanes and not worry too much if you constantly chuck it on the floor. It really has that carefree, I'm your friend adventure vibe uh, with the slight second caveat that the seat is a little bit pointy at the edges for someone with my posterior so maybe all day comfort needs a cool cover or something. Just a really good, honest, cheap bike that feels like it would go absolutely anywhere and when you inevitably throw it on the floor, super easy to pick up. And um, yeah, overall quite enjoyable. Worth noting that this one really saved my behind on this day. Um, this isn't in the footage, but we were stopped to turn right and uh, somebody came up behind me a little too fast, didn't realise I was there. And uh, because the bike felt so familiar and dependable, I was able to just rev the snot out of it and dump the clutch and dive out the way before I ended up under the front of a combi van. Um, the bike didn't misbehave in that moment, even at a full throttle clutch drop. It just took off, squashed down on its suspension and got me clean out of the way. I suppose that's a, a testament to how unthreatening this bike feels and from the riding that I did on this day what I really realised about myself is that if I'm going to be trying something new and so there are a few lanes on this day that um, I've done before and a few that felt a little bit more risque in the mud especially uh, with sort of wet mud over uh, over stone. I want a bike that feels really friendly and dependable and unthreatening. 
and the bikes that stood out to me on this day were the ones that felt unthreatening. The 310GS, to be fair to it, felt relatively unthreatening, ripping it along uh, on the tarmac. The Vosges felt really unthreatening, um, looking at the kind of terrain I'm riding along in here, right? It feels like if a car comes the other way, you can just throw it in a bush. And, of course, I told you it saved my bum. The other bike that feels like that we'll get onto in a second is the 452 Himalayan, but with a big caveat of its top heaviness. Um, and then the bike that, um, the other bike is the CF Moto 450, and we'll talk about that at the end. But that also feels very unthreatening for the size of bike that it is. And the Vosges embodies that. It's unthreatening, cheap thrills adventure. If you're not sure about one of these, go test ride it. I'd, I'd thoroughly recommend it. Um, and I feel it would sit on anyone's shortlist alongside a 411 Himalayan. Speaking of the Himalayan, here is the Himalayan 452. So I already confessed that I rode one of these on the tarmac as a test ride out of Watsonian Squire. And at the time, my thoughts on it were, it's kind of a hooligan. Talking back to what the Triumph has in way of its throttle map being really aggressive, the 452 has a really aggressive throttle map as well. It feels an awful lot more powerful than it is, and it kind of feels excitable and um, boisterous puppy. It will rev and pop. Um, and surprisingly, this one will, even down the tracks that we're looking at here, spin up its back wheel um, and let you kind of surf a bit of a roost around loose corners. And it feels really unthreatening in doing that. Now, Nathan made a really good point, is do you want to give that to a brand newbie off-road? And I'm not going to say that I'm anything other than a relatively new off-road rider. Been doing it a couple of years, don't feel like I've done it enough to say I'm even remotely good. Um, but probably have enough experience to handle that kind of excitable throttle. Would you give it to a brand new rider? I'm not sure. But that whole character of the engine, and very similar to the Triumph, is kind of surgy and exciting. It's absolutely great fun on the road, um, and it makes what is only a 30-odd, a 40-horsepower engine feel twice as powerful until you actually look at how fast you're traveling. In this off-road kind of terrain like this, um, this thing 90% of the time felt absolutely fantastic. The 10% of the time it didn't is when you realize how top-heavy it is. Now, I know that sounds like it's recycled from other reviewers, but honestly, as a bloke with shorter legs, as I've mentioned, that really came into its own a couple of times on this day when we were off-road and I had to stop and kind of drag the front wheel out of something I'd ill-advisedly put it into. All of a sudden it goes from being your best friend to a tower block with a, a massive lead weight on the top, and that's really unfortunate because in all other ways it feels like a juiced-up version of the 411, and as you can see right here in the footage, you can smash it into anything and it just bounds out the other side. I didn't feel more confident all day on any other bike than I felt on this one. The only thing I will say that I felt about this is a little bit disappointed in that it has become that kind of slightly ungainly tower block because it retains a lot of the character of the original Himalayan. It feels like you could take it anywhere. I just think if you did, you might find yourself in trouble when its weight um, sort of overcomes you. On the road, this thing is brilliant fun. It, it kind of feels scramblery, hooligany. I'm sure the Gorilla, which is the sort of un-Himalayan version of the Himalayan, is an absolute hoot on the road, primarily because of this engine. But there's nowhere I wouldn't take this bike if I if I didn't have to manhandle it. Um, I was, up until this day, going to buy one of these to maybe replace my 411 Himalayan, I wasn't sure, but after this experience and realising that I would probably limit myself in my continued learning of riding off-road, I decided that um, maybe it's better to focus a fraction of the money that I would have spent on this on playing about with my Himalayan to see if I can make it any more exciting. There'll be some videos about that coming, hopefully, but yeah, the, really like this bike, just a real shame that it's so top heavy. The other thing that one of the shorter guys on the day pointed out was that getting this thing off the side stand is an absolute mission because of that top heaviness and I completely agree. It leans really far over and it means that if you have to stop on a trail like this and put it on the stand um, you're constantly watching out to make sure it doesn't tip over. So uh, what's come on the top of my list well, it's the CF Moto 450 MT, and I'm really surprised by that. 
Uh, first of all, we'll start with the fact that while it looks like quite a big bike when it's sat in front of you, you know, it, it gave me images of my Tiger 800, it's got quite a wide tank at the top. The moment you sit on it, it dissolves, and it's actually quite a lightweight bike uh, underneath that. It is still, for me personally, um, a little bit off-putting, off-road not to be able to see down the sides of the bike as clearly as I can on a smaller bike, but um, it doesn't really matter once you stop looking. And it certainly doesn't matter once you open the throttle, because this thing absolutely wins the day for most characterful engine. It's not the most powerful thing in the world, but my goodness, when you snatch on that throttle, it snarls and it barks and it plays about, it pops and it crackles. yourself midway through a deep puddle, um, popping the throttle just to make it sound like you're doing something a bit more exciting than you are, um, as it snarls and crackles its way through the puddle and, uh, and the back wheel deliberately loses traction a little bit here and there. My enjoyment of this bike was only really hampered on this day by the fact that the tyres on it were not as knobbly as the tyres I'm used to. Lack of downward visibility for me was... Um, probably what restricted my confidence and had me sitting down a little more often than I was standing up, which, as you know, tends to hamper bike control, and then you sit down because you're not in control, and then you're not in control a bit more. The other thing that made this bike a bit of a handful is the way the throttle responds. It's very snatchy off idle. It feels like it probably needs a bit of smoothing out, and Nathan mentioned that there is an update to the throttle map coming that should help that. Um, it just means if you're less experienced, especially when you're stood up, it's a bit more prone to whiskey throttle. Um, it's not unrideable, you just need to go up a gear, but going up a gear makes the back wheel a little more eager to spin um, when you really don't have traction. Not a big thing, uh, you get used to it after a couple of minutes, but probably worth mentioning. So that's my winner of the day. Uh, would I buy one? No, probably not. Um, I was wedded to a new Himalayan, now I'm wedded to the idea of seeing what I can get out of my current Himalayan. But if I were suddenly adventure bikeless and I was looking to spend about this amount of money, it would have to be a real grind between the CF Moto and the new Himalayan. Either way, regardless of my thoughts of these bikes, or yours for that matter, a great day out was had by all. Um, and if you're thinking of buying an adventure bike, or in the small capacity market, please do head over to Nathan's website and get yourself on one of these A2 adventure days. At the very least, it's the most fun you can have for the money that's being asked. And I can only thoroughly recommend it. That and Nathan's a top chap. Um, he's a good laugh. And you'll probably meet like-minded people on those days who have completely different opinions to you that make you reevaluate what you think. So yeah, I'd better go and get back on with fixing the ST1100 before anyone else asks me um, if I've scrapped it. That's all from me. Have a great day and ride safe.